take you through Lunchtime Lecture by Gillian Clark. This poem takes the form of, I guess, an internal monologue from somebody who has gone along to a lunchtime lecture and, as I've said here, is inspired and moved by her encounter with the skeletal remains of an ancient human corpse. She builds a dramatic backstory of the discovery of these archaeological remains and finds herself feeling a surprisingly human and intimate connection with the woman she imagines. That, in a nutshell, is the poem as, as I can summarise it at the moment. I think it's probably useful for, particularly for younger viewers, to just give some attention to the title for a minute, Lunchtime Lecture, um, because it, it suggests to it, it would be very different if it were just called Lecture, but because it's Lunchtime Lecture, it gives it, it, gives it a context, it gives it a, a professional context. It, so Lunchtime Concerts and Lectures are things that working people tend to go to during the day. It's just something a little bit different, something to break up the week, something to give some variety to the working day. And it's it's something that people go to to, to break up their their routine and to find some enrichment and interest during their lunch hour. And I think that's probably important because if this if she were like a full time student attending a lecture, then this this encounter that she had would presumably be part of a, a kind of a, an archaeological program and and so it might be odd to us that she had this intense experience because we'd think well you're kind of studying archaeology can't can't you deal with this objectively whereas th that it, the fact that it's a lunchtime lecture suggests that this is something that that the the voice of this poem that the speaker behind the poem it's something that they've gone along to 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 be enriched and, and maybe even inspired by even if they're eating their cheese sandwiches whilst looking at the archaeological remains of of, of a human being so i think the title is important and and i've made a note about that up here so uh let's well let's get going i i've highlighted these first couple of words here let's just look at the first couple of lines and this from the 2nd or 3rd millennium BC, a female aged about 22. I've highlighted these words there because they, they just drop us straight into the poem. Now, this is a determiner. You can call it that. It's a determiner. Words like this, that, and these, those are determiners. They gesture towards a specific thing that they're pointing out. Now, this is just a poem. There's nothing there. There's just a poem on a table that you're reading. There is no female aged about 22 right in front of you. So I think you can point out, if you're writing about this about this poem, it, it's fair to say that this determiner is used to create the illusion that this scene is, is, is right in front of us. It, is, it helps to create the perspective of somebody who is actually there. And of course, it's it's it uses the present tense. Um, I, let me just find an example. So a bit later, as I look down at her, I feel none of the shock. So she's in the present tense. So this the combination of determiners and the present present tense. Uh, th those are two things which create a sense of immediacy in the poem, and and also create this the the impression I think that it. This is a, some sort of internal monologue that is voiced whilst the action is taking place. It's not a story that's told retrospectively when she gets back home. Then you've got the conjunction here. And this, from the second or third millennium, creates an illusion of continuity. We suddenly, we, we feel immediately that there's been, stuff has been going on before this. We're not even at the beginning of the lecture, we're in the middle of the lecture. So the poem feels incidental, perhaps. It's a, an incidental moment in real life, partly because of this conjunction that the um, 
that Gillian Clark has put in here. So we've got those two little features there, creating this sense of immediacy and and, and emphasizing the incidental quality of of this in this encounter, this 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 moving sort of meeting that Gillian Clark wants to document. And, and she does this all the time. She takes experiences from everyday life and and makes them meaningful and so that's what she's doing here and this from the second or third millennium bc a female age 22 so just notice the kind of the specialist language that's being used there we've got millennium second or third millennium bc a female not a woman a female aged about 22 so those kind of precise numerical scientific details there just laying the ground for well they're showing us that that this is well it's a scientific experience and that's going to be important later on because she develops this kind of quite quite a, a an emotional romantic feel to this experience but it starts off with the kind of details that i guess we might expect so I've written here, scientific interest mingled with more romantic storytelling preoccupation, but that comes a bit later. Now we've got some imagery here, moving on. A fine, a, a white fine skull. I've, put, I've just put skull in blue there because, again, it's kind of specialist technical detail. But white and fine is, is that's imagery. So... Uh, I've suggested here it's I imagery of purity and delicacy along alongside her her whiteness, which comes a bit later. A white fine skull, full up with darkness. Well, that's a metaphor. You can't be full up with darkness. Darkness is not a commodity that you can pour into to something. So, having had this kind of technical, very literal information here. We're moving into, we've got imagery here now, and then we've got a metaphor. So we're moving into more creative, imaginative territory. And we're, we're now getting a sense quite early on that the, the speaker of this poem is engrossed, interested, using her imagination, starting to dramatise the thing that she's seeing. Full up with darkness, as a shell with sea, drowned in centuries. Uh, so I, I've collected a few of those metaphors here. Full up with darkness, a uh, shroud of silence, comes a bit later, a crowd of light. Drowned in centuries, I could easily have put up there. You can't be drowned in centuries. Centuries are not a commodity any more than darkness is. The point here is that she's being abstract. Abstract, it's not concrete. You can't really imagine, you can't literally concretely imagine being drowned in centuries. So these abstract metaphors suggesting somebody whose imagination is working hard and 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 somebody who's engrossed and is really interested and captivated even by by what she's seeing. Small, perfect, just the kind of those list those listed adjectives there suggest of, of somebody judging, assessing, measuring, making sense of something. They're not coordinated with an and. It's almost as if these are just thoughts that are occurring to her one by one. The cranium, there's another technical word there. So still, al although this is a an imaginative experience for her, it's still a technical and scientific experience as well. The cranium would fit the palm of a man's hand. Some plague or violence destroyed her and her whiteness lay safe in a shroud of silence. I've highlighted some there. Some is a an article. So the definite article is the. This is a possible article, like a. Uh, but some. It just sounds a bit vague, because she doesn't know what the plague or violence was that destroyed her. The point is about this word, this choice of word, it, she's imagining it, she's speculating, and only speculating vaguely, because that's the best she can do. So we can kind of see the effort of her speculation there. Some plague or violence destroyed her. There's a biblical associations to plague or violence. 
book of Exodus, God sent a plague of locusts uh, to torment the Egyptians. The, uh, the, the Old Testament is full of plagues. It's just a, it's debatable there, but it, there's possibly a biblical association there. But but crucially, these are these are dramatic kind of features that she's imagining now. He destroyed her, not killed her or caused her death, which you might expect in a in you know from this the scientific context of this this lecture she's attending. But no, destroyed her. Some plague or violence destroyed her. So dramatic language being used there because she's imagining the fate of this woman destroyed her and her whiteness lay safe in a shroud it's interesting her, her whiteness not her body lay safe in a shroud her whiteness again imagery of purity and delicacy it's making her seem valuable and pure her whiteness lay safe in a shroud a shroud is also also has kind of religious connotations to do with burial and burial rites so she's she's dramatizing this story with biblical language, with um, with with imagery of purity and delicacy, with emotive language, uh, and abstract metaphors drowned in the centuries. So she lay safe in a shroud of silence, undisturbed, unrained on, dark for four thousand years. She's kind of you can see she this list of details here you can kind of feel her struggling to understand this length of time it's impossible for us to imagine that period of time really we can't really have any comprehension of it because we're here for a much shorter period than that so this listing of details undisturbed unrained on dark for four thousand years that's suggestive of her struggle to understand that that period of time. And again, she's engrossed. She's interested in this this lecture and this person that she feels she's been introduced to across this enormous time span. Till a tractor in summer, biting its way through the long can for supplies of stone, broke open the grave and let a crowd of light stare in at her and she stared quietly back now now she's imagining and dramatizing this key moment when the archaeological remains were discovered biting the, the tractor bites its way through the long cairn the long cairn a cairn is a a, a, a tomb with with a pile of stones on on the top long cairn is clearly a type of, of cairn so this was a tomb where the the underground tomb where the body was 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 discovered and uh, all over the British Isles you, you there are cairns which are often often found in they often exist in, in agricultural land and in this case that, that was the case here and so the, the tractor ploughing up the ground has accidentally unearthed this this body. Interesting that she sort of personifies the tractor as biting its way through the long can. I don't think there's anything particularly sort of. It, it would be tempting to read this biting as as something you know vicious or violent. And I just think she's imagining the the sharpness. Uh, and, and yeah, the 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 kind of the if you well if you like a sort of a violent action the sharp the sharpness of of this tool required to dig her up so it does give it a bit of drama I'm just I, I'm just be careful I'm I'm not suggesting that she's trying to cast the tractor as some sort of enemy I I don't think that's really the point she's just imagining the the action of of the of the, of the tool that ended up accidentally unearthing her so biting its way through the cairngorm it broke open the grave not you know accidentally revealed the grave to the open air it 
broke open the grave. So a bit of personification there, dramatising this important moment when this body came to light. Dramatised also through, through this crowd of lights. So the light is personified, the crowd of light staring at her. So the, the tractor and the light are personified and it, it dramatises the story and maybe makes makes this this woman that she's imagining more more vulnerable. So there's a kind of an, an empathy there between her and the woman because of this of this drama and this personification that happens. It's interesting that she 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 went for the grave there, but she's imagining it clearly and, and individually now. I've highlighted till because she could easily have written until, but until would be more formal. And it's it's interesting that she she chooses till and she places it at the beginning of a sentence. So it it I've suggested it 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 gives it a sort of a, a folk song like or or folk story like quality there. She stared quietly back. So yeah, she's personifying the corpse. I mean, obviously the corpse didn't really stare back, but she's personifying it. She's humanizing the corpse. She's already started doing that really by referring to her, destroyed her and imagining her. Now I haven't annotated these, these other stanzas in quite the same level of detail. That's, that's something really if you're studying this poem for, for you to do independently but I will kind of go through the rest of the poem uh, with you so she at this point she's Gillian Clark or her voice is 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 now placed in in the scene in the scene of we're in this lecture hall or wherever we are but it's the first time that the, the voice of the poem has actually or the person behind the voice has had any agency. As I look at her, I feel none of the shock the farmer felt as unprepared he found her. Okay, so she didn't feel shock, but she's she's reflecting on her own reaction. Here in the museum, like death in hospital, reasons are given, labels, causes, catalogues. This is the passive voice, reasons are given. We don't know who's giving the reason, some scientist, some archeologist somewhere, reasons are given that's the passive voice and it seems impersonal it seems scientific we would expect it to be impersonal really this is a 4,000 old body there isn't a living being there so it needs sort of labeling cataloging but of course she's developed this connection with it so there's just a, a, a juxtaposition there between the sort of the coldness of this scientific inquiry and the the intimate connection that she's felt with the the woman behind this story that she's learning about the smell of death is done well the body's decomposed there is there's no there's no smell of, of death because it, it's just the body's it's just a skeleton left only her bone purity the light and shade beauty that her man was denied sight of Describing the skeleton here, the perfect edge of the place where the pieces join, with no mistakes, like boundaries. There's a sort of admiring quality to this detail that she builds up here, admiring the neatness and the function of the, the biological form. It's slightly disconcerting in a way. She, not everybody would necessarily pour over a. The remains of a corpse in this in this way but so there's, there's a strange mixture of her interest in the the woman and the body and what's left of it into the the final stanza she gets more adventurous again now having done that kind of clinical looking at the the remains of the body now she gets more adventurous with it she's a tree in winter well no she's not but but yes she is she's a tree in winter stripped white of uh, sorry stripped white on a black sky grief 
ridiculous formality. So comparing a body stripped of flesh to a tree stripped of its of its leaves, stripped white on a black sky. Oh, stripped white because the, the skeleton is white on a black sky. Leafless formality. Brow. Bow in fine relief, as in the boughs of a tree. So she's just developing this tree metaphor here, comparing her to a tree. Um, why? Well, trees are beautiful. Trees are dignified. So she's she's dignifying this this woman uh, as she moves this poem towards a, a dramatic climax. I've suggested here. And then she starts comparing herself with the skeleton and imagining a bond between herself with the woman. I, at some other season, so not winter, at some other season, spring maybe, illustrate the tree fleshed. So I'm a fleshed version of the tree with woman's hair and colours and the rustling blood. And that's an interesting juxtaposition there. Rustling blood. Blood is not, it's not like leaves, blood to liquid. It, it it doesn't rustle, so it's a it's a strange metaphor and an onomatopoeia, I guess as well. It's a tricky one that one. I mean, why why rustling blood? Is it is it um, is it just reminding us that all blood will sort of will will br will will dry, and when 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 we die, the rustling blood. I'm not sure. Fleshed with woman's hair and colours and the rustling blood. The troubled mind that she has overthrown. I've suggested death as a sort of victory here. She's, she's The troubled mind that she has overthrown. Well, she's overthrown her troubled mind by dying. Is, I think, the most literal way I can, I can explain that. But again, to... to to describe death as an overthrowing of a troubled mind, that's quite dramatic and quite a sort of dramatic, almost an epic way of describing death. And then we have this imagery of intimacy and connection. We stare at each other. It's imagery, it's not, you know, it's not intricately built up imagery, but it is a sort of imagery. Dark into sightless dark, so she gets a bit more adventurous with the imagery here. Dark into sightless dark. Seeing only ourselves in the black pools. There's more imagery there. Gulping the risen sea that booms in the shell. I've just suggested here, is this time? Is, is, the, is, the, is the risen sea that booms in the shell, is that time? If the vast eternity of time is the ocean, then our experience of life is merely like putting your ear to the, to the shell. We can't experience the ocean of time, we can just put our ear to the shell. But of course she's also refer returning to this, she uses the shell reference up here. I've lost it. Where's it gone? Sorry, there it is. White fine skull full up with darkness as a shell with sea. So, well, you, uh, if you, if you raise it, the, the, the kind of the common story is that if you, if you put a sea shell to your ear, you can hear the sea. So, it may also, that may be a metaphor for, instead of the sound of the sea, so if the skull is the shell, then she's she's not putting the, the shell to her ear, but she's studying it. And instead of the shell giving her the sound of the sea, the, the skull is sort of giving her this, this story. So that's another way of metaphorically explaining it. But it's the, it's the booming in the shell. That's, it's that expansive onomatopoeia there, that booming, which makes me think of the vast expanse of time. And, how, and, and and so this this ambiguous it is ambiguous this ambiguous metaphor here 
possibly suggestive of the immensity of time and, and a, a, perhaps a reflection that, that she, like this woman, long dead for thousands of years, and all of us are only here for, for, for a very short period of time. So just to recap, it's a very sort of ordinary experience she, she has. She goes in the middle of the day, but she has an encounter, and it's an encounter that moves her. And, and so she spends this poem dramatising this meeting that she has with this, with this, with this woman. And speaking of time being short, it's time for me to draw this 